please uh, be seated. And uh, if you could turn in your uh, Bibles um, or on your phone or whatever device you're using uh, back to Psalm 96 in the Old Testament that uh, Mean read earlier in the service, we'll be looking um, at uh, that uh, passage. But let, before we do so, let's uh, pray together. Father, we thank you for your deep, deep love in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thank you that that is a message we want to spread from shore to shore. We want everyone everywhere in this world to hear of your love for sinners in the Lord Jesus Christ and all he did through his death on the cross. And uh, Lord, as we come to your word uh, today, we pray that you'd help us to understand that more and what it means to take this great message of your love in Jesus uh, to other nations, other peoples. And on this World Mission Sunday, Lord, we pray that you would motivate us uh, to go out and to tell people, beginning where we are in our Jerusalem, and we pray that the gospel would spread uh, further and further. So here are prayers. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it has been uh, said that the church exists for mission as fire exists for burning. Mission is what the church of Jesus Christ is about. Mission is at the very essence of what the church uh, is. And what is this mission? Well, it is the making of disciples of Jesus from all the nations of the world through the proclamation of the gospel. The mission we have is the making of disciples of Jesus from all the nations of the world through the proclamation of the gospel. And this making of disciples begins when, in some way, the gospel is made known to people who turn in faith to Jesus Christ as Savior and commit themselves to being his disciples and living under his lordship. Uh, the mission of the church in general, in our church here at East London Tabernacle, in particular, is to see that happening, is to see the proclamation going on so that people from all nations turn to God for salvation in Jesus Christ. And this morning, I want us to think about our mission as a church uh, from Psalm uh, 96. Now, some people might think that Psalm 96 is a strange place or passage to turn to to think uh, about a uh, mission. After all, this psalm is in the Old Testament, which uh, many people don't associate uh, with the mission of the church. Uh, if you were going to pick a passage for World Mission Sunday, uh, you might go to Matthew 28, where Jesus commissions us to go into the world and make disciples, or Acts, 2, uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, or, or Acts 28, or indeed all of the book of Acts uh, that uh, Andy was reading from uh, earlier, or other, even other parts of the New Testament. Uh, but to think that, that uh, a passage like this from the Old Testament is not really about missions, is indeed a mistake. For all of the Bible, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, is about mission. Uh, the Bible is a story of God's unfolding plan to save people from all nations through the Lord Jesus Christ. So wherever you turn in the Bible, you are dealing with mission in one form or another. And it shouldn't surprise us then that to find the Psalms like this one here and others like it, celebrating what God has done, is doing, and will do to bring his salvation to the nations. And as a hymn of praise, the psalm invites everyone, everywhere, to make known through song the greatness of our missionary God. And it's so important that we do that as God's people. As Christians, we love to sing about many things uh, that in one way or another extol the greatness of God as our creator and as our redeemer. And we do so not uh, merely as a, a ritual or because it's a, a nice thing to do in church. You know, you're supposed to sing in church, so we just sing for its own sake. But that's not really the reason. And even less is our singing uh, about artistic expression. Um, although uh, music and church can be very artistically uh, beautiful. Now, when we sing as Christians, we do so to express our emotions and to strengthen others to do so in response to what God has revealed about himself in the Bible. Uh, John Calvin said that the purpose of singing in the church really was to stir up our affections in praise of God. And we can do that ourselves, but we can also do that with each other, to stir up our affections together, to praise our God for who he is as our creator and as 
our Redeemer. And this God whom we praise has revealed himself as a missionary God. And in saying that, I'm not I'm merely saying that God wants churches like ours to do evangelism and to send people to other nations uh, with the gospel. Uh, we've been hearing earlier about uh, the hookers in Namibia and Mike and Renu in South Africa and the Richards in Nova Sabursk. And of course, we also have connections with Myanmar, with Madagascar and uh, with other uh, countries um, as well. Uh, I work, as it does Alistair, with uh, Pastor Training International, involved in many countries of the world. And, but when we say that God is a missionary God, we don't only mean that he's sending people out to different countries of the world. Uh, he, he does want us to do that. But mission is about more than that. No, mission is about God's ultimate purpose in sending his church to the nations with the gospel uh, so that his uh, whole creation will be restored as men and women are saved and become into his kingdom. And as we proclaim the gospel, God is using us to accomplish something far greater than we can imagine. And this psalm will help us to see this so that we can be encouraged in what God has given us to do in this work, this glorious work of missions that God has given us to do. So our three points I want you to draw your attention to from Psalm 96. And the verse is this, the glory of God is the theme of our mission as a church. The glory of God is the theme of our mission as a church. What is it that we declare to the world? What is this message that we make known uh, to the world? Well, it is the glory of God. Look at verse uh, 3. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. The glory of God is the outshining of who God is. God himself is invisible. He dwells in light, in, invisible, in light. He, 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 we cannot see, no one can see God as he is in himself. No sinful mortal can bear the sight of God as he is in himself as God. As God said to Moses, no one can see me and live. But graciously, God reveals himself to us. Uh, someone has defined God's glory as his invisible and active presence in the world. His, in, his, his, sorry, has his visible, not invisible, has his visible and active presence in the world. God's glory is God making himself known to us in what he says and in what he does. And as a king reveals his majesty in his royal insignia, so in, in an infinitely greater way, and on an infinitely greater scale, God reveals his majesty in his word and in his works. And that's what we are to declare to the nations as God's people. Again, verse 3, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among um, all peoples. God's glory is revealed in his name. It's revealed in his salvation. It's revealed in his marvelous uh, deeds. Uh, the psalmist probably had in mind the revelation of God's glory in his name at Mount Sinai. You remember uh, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and God hit him. He told him, you can't see me as I am or you die. No man can do that. But then God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. And then Moses could see something on the outer fringe of God's glory. A glimpse of who God is. And this is what we read in Exodus 34, verses 5 and 7. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love for thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and the, their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. That perhaps was in the mind of the psalmist as he wrote uh, this psalm. He certainly had in mind God's great work of saving his people from slavery in Egypt. That great, marvelous work where God took his people enslaved by, by the Egyptians and in a wonderful way brought them 
out of Egypt, having brought judgment on the Egyptians and brought them through the Red Sea and eventually to himself at Mount Sinai and eventually then to the Promised Land. The Exodus was the great work of salvation in the Old Testament. And in her worship, Israel was to declare uh, this not only to herself, but also to the nation. She wasn't just simply to tell herself and remind herself that, yes, God had rescued us in this way. No, we want everywhere, or every nation, people from all nations to know this, to hear what God has done in saving his people. And she did so knowing that the gods of the nations were idols. They were nothing but emptiness. Again, uh, listen to... Uh, uh, what it says, it says, we're to sing God's praise, proclaim his salvation, day after day declare his glory among the nations, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The gods of the worlds, the, the idols people worship, the nations worship, were nothing. They were emptiness, vanity, nothing there. The God of Israel is the one true God who alone is the creator of everything and the redeemer of his people. But where do we see the glory of God today? We're not, we're not with Moses on Mount Sinai. We're not even in the temple in Jerusalem where the glory of God was manifested in, in, a, in measure. But where do we see God's glory today? Well, of course, we can see God's glory in his creation. All creation declares God's glory. The heavens declare the glory of God, says Psalm 19. It's all of creation reveals who God is. Again, Calvin said that the creation is the theater of God's glory. It's where he displays something of his splendor. And, of course, all scripture is a revelation of God's glory as he reveals to us in its pages his works and his words. But supremely, the glory of God is revealed in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what the uh, Apostle John uh, tells us. We saw it in our series in, in John's um, uh, gospel uh, earlier this year and last year. But John chapter 1, we, we read uh, in uh, how uh, Jesus eternally is in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then we read in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who has come from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's in Jesus, who is the radiance of God's glory, as the writer to the Hebrews puts it, that, that we see the glory of God. Elsewhere, the Bible speaks of Jesus as the image of the invisible God, the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his being. In the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, we behold the glory of God. Uh, this is how Paul puts it in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's by the Spirit, as we by faith behold the, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we behold his glory and are transformed by it. It's in Jesus that supremely the glory of God is revealed. But it is in his work as our Redeemer that Jesus most fully reveals uh, the glory of God. Uh, before he went to die on the cross, uh, Jesus prayed uh, to the Father and spoke of his work, what he was about to accomplish through his death in terms of uh, glory. And so again, in John's Gospel, chapter 17, we read this in the, the beginning of that great high priestly prayer of, of Jesus. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son with, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus was with the Father and the Spirit in glory. 
came into this world, glorified the Father in his work, would glorify the Father supremely in his work on the cross. And now he was returning to the Father where he would ha- share again in the fullness of the glory which he had from all uh, eternity. And in the obedience, in the suffering, in the death of the Lord Jesus, we see th- the glory of God. We see the compassion. We see the grace, the patience, the faithfulness, the justice, the holiness, the goodness, the wisdom of God displayed. And in Jesus' resurrection, three days after his death, the glory of God is revealed as he is declared by the Spirit to be the Son of God with power. Now it is the revelation of the glory of God in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we must declare to the nations. This is the glory that we are to declare to the nations. This is the great theme of our mission um, as a, a church, whether it's here in what we do locally in my land in East London, or whether it's what through our missionaries we're doing in other parts of the world or in partnership with other churches and other uh, missionaries and other ministries doing in other parts of uh, the world. It's, this is the great theme, the glory of God that we have in mission. And whether in our public worship and, and preaching or in our Bible studies, or evangelism courses, or in our children and youth work, or in our outreach into the community, or in our own personal uh, witness, or in sending our missionaries into other cultures and other uh, countries. The glory of God in our Lord Jesus Christ is our great theme. Everything that we do should point to the Lord Jesus, in whom the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Let's then do all we can to preach Christ to as many people as we can. Let us use the opportunities and the circumstances and the gifts the Lord has given each one of us in different ways to declare his glory in Christ to unbelievers. That might mean just doing it with people at work or in your neighbors or or, uh, someone you meet at church or uh, someone like that. Or it might mean going into another culture in this country or overseas to make the glory of God known. But wherever we do, do it, that is what we're to do it, do. Of course, in doing this, our mission field is not only here in the East End, but it is London, this big global international city in which we find ourselves. It is the United Kingdom, it is Europe, and it is the world as we work to make Christ known. And in all that we do as a church, it is the glory of God in our Lord Jesus Christ that is the theme of our mission. But secondly, let's uh, note that the worship of God is the goal of our mission as a church. The worship of God is the goal of our mission as a church. As we proclaim the glory of God in Christ to the world, what is our goal? What are we trying to accomplish? What is the purpose that we want to see fulfilled? What do we want to see as as the result of all our efforts, whatever they might be, whether they're, again, here through this church in our own personal lives, or through our ministries as a church here and in other cultures and other nations. Well, what we want to see is people from all nations worshiping God. We want people to turn from from worshiping their false gods to worship the one true and living God. Because this God alone is worthy of praise since he alone is God. There is no other God. And people are worshiping their false gods, but he is the living and true God, and we want people to worship uh, him. Now, when this psalm was written, Israel was surrounded by peoples and nations worshiping false gods in the forms of of various idols. And you go to the British Museum, and you can see some of those idols that people were worshiping in Assyria and in Babylon and Persia and uh, uh, elsewhere. But today, it's essentially no different uh, for us in the world today among the nations. Uh, some people do literally worship uh, idols. You go to countries where people, there are temples and there are shrines and there will be an idol uh, there that people bow down to and worship. Uh, others who follow non-Christian religions have false concepts of God, uh, even if they reject literal idolatry, uh, whether that be Allah in Islam or uh, various other gods. It might be monotheists, and yet if they have a false understanding of who God is, of how God has revealed himself in the Bible, that is in essence, an idol. 
Still others, uh, perhaps most people in our culture, worship something in the creation rather uh, than uh, God. They can worship things like money or power or status or looks or security or family or race or health or you can name it. We can make anything, even the best of things, in God's creation into idols. In fact, we can more or less make a false god out of any. Again, I keep on quoting Calvin, but he's a great hero of mine. But he said our hearts, the human heart, the fallen human heart is a factory of idols. We're just sort of pumping them out. We'll turn to anything instead of worshiping the living and true God. But whatever we substitute for God, in the end, we find it to be empty. It's a vanity. It's a void. It is not the living God. It is, in the words of Jeremiah, an empty cistern in which we try to find life and try to find fulfillment, try to find meaning but it's empty. There's nothing uh, there. No, it is the true God that we and everyone must worship. He alone is the creator in whose presence um, are uh, are splendor and majesty and strength, as we read in verse 6. Verse splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. And therefore, the heart of our mission as a church, is to call people from all nations, whatever their religion, whatever their background, to turn from their false gods to this God so that they can worship him and give him the worship and the honor and the glory that is his due alone as God. And we invite everyone everywhere to worship this God. Verse 7, ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Here's Israel inviting the nations to come up to Jerusalem. Come and worship this God. He is the living and true God. Turn from your idols. Worship this living and true God. And that's what we do too. We invite people to turn from their false gods wherever they are and, and call them to ascribe glory and honor and praise to the living and true God. And it's not only uh, believers who are invited to worship God, uh, but uh, unbelievers. That's what evangelism is about. You see, our, go- our goal in proclaiming the gospel in our evangelism, whether it be here in uh, London or wherever we might be, it's not simply to win converts. It's not simply to have people who, who, who uh, come and are converted. We do want that, don't we? We do want conversion. But we want more than converts, mere converts. We want worshipers. That's what we're aiming for. We want worshipers of the living and true God. We want people to ch- change the object of their worship. That's what it means to become a Christian, to change the object of your worship from worshiping yourself and the idols of this world to worshiping the living and the true God. Now, this is truly God-centered evangelism. So much that passes for evangelism is man-centered. It focuses on the benefits we get from becoming a Christian. Now, there are amazingly great benefits to being a Christian in all kinds of ways. And it's the best thing you can do, the best thing for your life and for your family if you become a Christian. But in a sense, these things, great as they might be, are secondary to something far greater. Indeed, uh, the benefits we we get are means uh, to this greater end. And what is that greater end? It is the worship of God. That's what we want it to be. All the benefits are secondary to this great end, which is that God is worshipped. That is that we worship God. Because of all that he has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that he is in himself, we want to ascribe Glory to God. And the truth is that such God-centered worship is the greatest benefit to us. Whatever other benefits there are to becoming a Christian, the greatest benefit is that we are worshiping this God. For as we worship God, we begin to reflect his character. And we begin to become increasingly like him. It's been said that we become what we worship. We become what we worship. If we worship an idol, we will become like that idol. 
Uh, Psalm um, 115, just over a few pages if you want to turn there. Psalm 115, verses 2 to 8, uh, put it like this. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their gods are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. And those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. You might remember the film Lord of the Rings and this golem who sort of, he wants this ring, doesn't he? He wants this ring and he, he, he's obsessed by it and he becomes something, had been something beautiful and he becomes something ugly as he's obsessed because that's become his idol, the thing he lives for, the thing he wants more than anything else. And in, in a way, that's what happens with us. When we worship the wrong thing, we become like what we worship. Not something beautiful, but something ugly if it's not the living and true God. One way to understand hell is that, there, is that those who did not worship God become eternally the false gods they worship. They become like these false gods that they worship. They, they turn in and in further into themselves, become something ugly. But if we worship the living and true God, this God who has revealed himself fully in Jesus Christ, the one in whom all the fullness of deity dwelt, we will become increasingly like him now and for eternity. In other, in other words, we become more fully human as God intended us to be in the beginning when he created us in his image. That image is restored and we come to reflect the glory, glory of God revealed in Jesus Christ. In worshiping God, we find our meaning and purpose in life because we become increasingly like God himself. Now, what does this mean practically for us as a church? Well, it means several uh, things. First, it means that we must keep God, whose glory is revealed in Christ, at the center of our message and all that we do in our evangelism and in our missions. Evangelism is about proclaiming the glory of God in Christ to everyone, beginning where we are. We must keep the, this, this message of the glory of God in Jesus Christ at the very center of, of, of all that we are doing, so that people will come to worship God. And the second, uh, repentance is essential to how people must respond to uh, this message. For repentance is basically what it means to change the object of our worship. That's what repentance is, changing the object of our worship. Paul made this point when uh, writing to the Thessalonians. He had been in Thessalonica preaching the gospel. A number of people became Christians. Very quickly, though, persecution broke out, and he had to um, uh, leave the city quickly after a few weeks. Uh, but he wanted to find out how these young believers were doing. And uh, he'd heard a report, and he was so encouraged by what he had heard. And this is what he writes in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Verse 8, the Lord's message rang out from you. You know, these people had come to believe in God. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. And therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. You see what Paul says happened to these Thessalonians who uh, some had been Jews, some had been uh, pagans, but they hear this message, they believe. What happened? They, they, he says that, you know, they, you, that you turn from, to God from idols. So they turned to God, they turned away from their idols to God. So enraptured were they with God, the salvation in God, in Jesus Christ, that they returned from their idols to this God and believed in him and lived for him waiting for his son, the Lord Jesus, to return to save them from the coming wrath. That's what repentance is. That's what conversion is about. This is why repentance is so important in the New Testament evangelism, and it must be in ours as well. We're calling people to change their idols, to not worship themselves or the things they've lived for that have made their gods, but to live, worship and live 
serve the living and true God in Jesus Christ. And third, our public worship should be evangelistic in nature. As we expect non-Christians to be among us and by God's grace to repent and believe and to begin to worship this living and uh, true God. That's what Paul expected in these early churches. Uh, we have a glimpse of this in, in 1 Thessalonians 14. Uh, he's dealing with a whole problem. There was a big issue in Thessalonica that they were using in their public worship. They had um, uninterpreted uh, languages being said that unbelievers couldn't understand what they were talking about. And uh, he said this was sort of wrong. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, that is, everyone is speaking something they understand, preaching, as it were, they are convinced of sin and brought under judgment by all as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, and so they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Now, that's what we should want to be happening in our uh, church. And hopefully when we get finally out of this lockdown, we are here again, and there are more and more uh, unbelievers among us. And I trust on the, online, through the live stream and so on, there are unbelievers listening uh, uh, to us. Couldn't happen back there in the early church. They have all that. So thank God we have all this technology now. But nevertheless, whatever way it happens, we want unbelievers to be hearing the gospel in the context of our worship and their, their hearts being laid bare, and the God, they suddenly realize that they're sinners, and that there is a living and true God, and it's only through Jesus Christ they can be saved, and they repent and believe and fall down and begin to worship God. That's what Paul expected. That's what we should expect happening in our church's services. Now, so much more could be said, but my point is simply that in our mission as a church, the worship of God is our goal as we proclaim his glory to everyone. The worship of God is our goal as we proclaim his glory to everyone. And before I leave this point, I want to speak to anyone who isn't a a, a Christian listening uh, online uh, this morning. Uh, Perhaps you've uh, just come online uh, today out of curiosity. Uh, You've been, you know, going around the internet finding churches curious, you know, and there's so many out there. You can go, you worship all day if you want to. You go to every church in the world. Well, not every church in the world, but you go all over the world. Uh, it's connecting with services one kind or another. Somehow, though, you're with us right now uh, listening uh, to me. And uh, or you might have been the first time. You might have been connecting with us for some time. You might have actually been in the church at some point. Uh, you may uh, be from the United Kingdom. You might be from another uh, country. Your background may be religious. It might be totally irreligious. You may be younger, you might be older, you might be of different, of different ethnic groups of some kind. Well, whoever you are, and for whatever reason you've, you've come online to us today, I invite you to worship God. Worship this God who has revealed himself fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not worshiping God, then you are worshiping an idol or a false god of some kind. You know what that is. You know that thing that controls your life, why you make the decisions you do, why you live the way you do, the thing that is most important to you than anything else. Well, all such gods are false, and they're empty, and they cannot give you what you want from them. You must repent of that and turn to the living and true God and worship him alone. Verse 8, ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Turn to him, not with a literal offering. Don't have to do that anymore. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and then devote your life to him. That's what you're being invited to do today, to trust in Jesus and then to devote yourself to him. Bring the offering of your life to God as you trust in him to save you because of what Jesus did on the cross in bearing your sin. And only as you trust Christ can you be saved and begin to worship God with your lips and with your life. Will you do that? Even wherever you are, right at home or wherever you're listening, uh, however you're listening right now, will you do that? Right now, you can turn to God from your idols and give him the worship that he deserves. Which brings us then to the third thing we want to see this morning, and that is that the kingdom of God is the hope of our mission as a church. The kingdom of God is the hope of our mission as a church. If we are to fulfill our mission as a church, 
of declaring God's glory to the nations so that people from all of those nations will come and worship him. We need hope to sustain us. Uh, carrying out a, a, a mission with little or any hope of success is a, a pretty thankless uh, task. I've just been reading a great book about Ben McIntyre on the SAS. It's fantastic. If you want a good book to read, uh, just a exciting uh, about, story about the founding of the SAS during the Second uh, World War. And they faced a lot of trouble, a massive amount of loss of life and so on. But they had hope that they would win the war. They had this hope, and they, they, the commanders kept on preaching this hope because they had hope that all the sacrifice was worthwhile if they would, uh, if, if they kept persevering and enduring and sacrificing yeah, because they had this hope that they would win. And if we're going to fulfill our mission as a church, we must have this hope. Uh, nothing could be more demotivating than not having hope. But as God's people, we do have hope of success. And not hope in the sense of a vague wish that somehow it's all going to turn out okay, but the solid certainty that God will do what he has promised. And that hope that we have is the kingdom of God. Indeed, right now, we announce this kingdom. Look at verse uh, 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved, and he will judge the peoples with equity. Right now, we announce the reign, the kingdom of God. The Lord is king. He is sovereign over everything that happens in this world. And though, and through the centuries, um, his kingdom uh, was revealed to his people Israel as he unfolded it through uh, the various covenants and the things he was doing with his people Israel. But with Jesus, the king himself has come. The king has come. Jesus began his ministry saying, repent for the kingdom is at hand, meaning I am here, I am the king, I have come. And in his ministry, Jesus demonstrated the presence of his kingdom and by his death he, and his resurrection, he defeated sin, death, and the devil. The king had come, and his kingdom was demonstrated, and his kingdom came into being through his life, his death, and resurrection. And now, exalted to the right hand of his father, Jesus reigns until all his enemies are defeated. That is the kingdom of God, the saving reign of God in Jesus Christ. That reign that's being exercised right now from the throne of God in heaven by Jesus. Jesus is on his Father's throne reigning over all things. That is his kingdom. That's the kingdom that is our hope. Now the fact that uh, the Lord reigns as creator and redeemer should give us great confidence in our mission as a church. Uh, but it is the coming of the kingdom in all its fullness at the end of history that assures us of success. When Jesus returns in power and in glory, as he has promised to, the, the Lord will judge the peoples with equity and the world in righteousness and all the peoples with his truth, as it says in verses 10 and 13. There is a day coming when justice will be perfectly done. In this world, there's so much injustice. People suffer so badly in so many ways. Human beings can be terrible to other human beings. And often when the guilty go unpunished for a crime, uh, people complain that justice hasn't been done. And of course, if they, people believe this world is all there is and this life is all there, <clears throat> there is, then there is no final justice. There is a lot of injustice in this world. Many suffer gross injustices, not least persecuted Christians. But on the last day, when Jesus returns, God will judge everyone who has ever lived and re reward or punish everyone accordingly. There will be justice, as the psalmist tell us, tells us. The justice will come. The kingdom will come in its fullness. Jesus will return. He will judge everyone. And everyone will be rewarded according to how, what they have done. However, the coming of God's kingdom will not only mean judgment. It will not only mean judgment. The coming of God's kingdom will also mean salvation. For then, all who have trusted in Jesus will enter the eternal kingdom. When Jesus comes back, and there is a, on that day of judgment, 
those who have trusted in him will not be condemned with those who haven't, but will enter the eternal kingdom. We will enter that kingdom not because we deserve to, but because of Jesus and what he suffered, because he suffered judgment in our place. He suffered the judgment of God that we deserve on the cross, bearing our sins, suffering the punishment in our place. But the coming of the kingdom in its fullness means salvation in another way. It's not only that we not, will not be condemned on that day and enter uh, into uh, our eternal salvation in the new heaven and new earth. That will happen and that will be glorious. You know, it's, that's only the beginning. For when Jesus returns and we are revealed as the sons and daughters of the living God, the whole creation will celebrate God's salvation with us. Look at verse 11. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the seas resound in all that's in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. And he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. The creation that because of our sin has been subjected to frustration and bondage to decay, as the Apostle Paul puts it in his letter to the Romans, will be liberated and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. That's what's being described here. The liberation of the creation from all the effects of sin and the fall, along with us, God's redeemed people. Oh, my friends, what a wonderful, glorious hope this is. In the end, when Jesus returns, God's kingdom will come in its fullness. And when we're discouraged in our mission, or just in our own lives as Christians, as as it is so easy to be, remind yourself, and let's remind each other of this hope. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And we can hardly even imagine what that best is. It is so glorious, so beyond what we could even begin to imagine. The best is yet to come. And our efforts now that can seem so unavailing and even futile are not in vain. Another psalm puts it, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Psalm 126 verse 5, those who sow in tears those who carry out their ministry of evangelism, of witness, of doing things with people who seem to show no gratitude, never say thank you for what you're, you've done for them, or whatever else it might be. All those things that seem so, those labors that seem so unavailing, so futile. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Oh, what joy there will be when the kingdom comes in its fullness. And may that hope sustain us in our mission as a church. In the work of the kingdom, we cannot fail because our God reigns and his kingdom will come in its fullness. Do you see then why we sing in praise of our missionary God? God is at work among us and through us in advancing his saving reign in this world. And that is what our mission as a church here at ELT is all about. I'll be retiring in the course of next year, but that will be continue to be mission. That's been the mission, my ministry. It's been the mission of ministries before me since this church was established. It will be, I trust, the ministry of this church for years and years and years to come. By God's grace, may we keep this mission that God has given us going. And in this mission, the glory of God is our theme. We want to proclaim the glory of God in Jesus Christ making it known to everyone, communicating it in as many ways as we can so that people understand from the Bible who Jesus is and how God's glory is revealed in him. And in this mission, the worship of God is our goal. We want to call people who are worshiping idols now to worship the living and true God who has revealed himself fully in Jesus Christ. We want people to turn to God from their idols and worship him alone. And in our mission, the kingdom of God is our 
our hope. We, want, we long for that day when Jesus returns and his kingdom comes in its fullness. His kingdom is he's reigning now, and we're serving in that kingdom. But that kingdom is going to come in its fullness, and he will return, and we'll be in that kingdom eternally in a new creation. And we hope with us there will be many, many others who have turned from their idols and to serve the living and true God who will be there with us. Doesn't that make you want to sing a new song to the Lord? That's how we began. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. We want to sing this new song to the Lord. Does this theme of missions want you to do that? Well, if it does, sing this new song, not only with your lips, but with your life, with everything that God has given to you. Devote yourself, heart and soul and body, to the great mission that cannot fail. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this great mission you've given us as a church. We thank you that its theme is your glory revealed in Jesus Christ, that its purpose is to bring people to worship you. We want people to join us in worshiping you, not only with our lips and their lips, but with lives devoted to you. People living around us here in the East End, worshiping now their false gods, may they begin to be worshipers of the living and true God. And Father, we have Your kingdom is the hope of our mission, knowing that it will come in its fullness when Jesus returns in power and in glory. So keep us going, Father, in the mission you've given us here, whether it's work we do in our own personal lives or through the ministries of ELT here in this community or elsewhere in London or throughout this nation or in other parts of the world in partnership with our mission missionaries or uh, other agencies and groups or simply with other Christians as we pray and support persecuted believers and Christians in other countries, Lord, we pray, your kingdom will come your, and will grow. And many will turn to you, the living and true God. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.